This video is from an on-farm heifer selection workshop at Mr. Omar McCants Farm in Talbotton, Georgia by Mr. Jason Duggan and Dr. Lee Jones from University of Georgia with Dr. Ralph Noble and Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State University and Mr. Handy Kennedy from AgriUnity LLC. The thing that was just mentioned was something that, that Dr. Noble was talking about. He was talking about how our kids are not, are not always doing what you want them to do. They're not always performing like they should. And what he means by that is sometimes we've got to be critical. We're not going to be critical for our own herds. So what that's called in uh, cowboy logic is called uh, barn blindness. I think all my cattle are good all the time. There is no problems with these. When I'm taking them to the cell barn, I don't know why they didn't get what they should have got. That was, I, I got robbed at the cell barn. And that's what we say. And sometimes that might be the case in certain, certain instances that something was missed. But lots of times we just got to look at what we're doing. And so today we're going to look at Mr. McCant's cattle, and he has some good cattle, all right? But we're going to dissect every little detail, stuff that doesn't really matter. We're going to look at it anyway just for educational purposes, right? So we're going to hammer on some really good cattle, and we're going to think about every little thing. But before we go out to the cattle, let's look at just a couple of small things. So if we are on the online version of this, you know, we went over just a, a few slides talking about how to look at cattle. So there's two things we have now. We have looking at animals, and now we also have looking at some data. A uh, hundred years ago in particular, all we had were the visual parts. They had shows in Chicago, uh, the International Livestock Show in Chicago. That was the end all be all about how to progress genetically. Well, now we have lots of other stuff, too, and we're going to go through that as the go day goes on. But we should never look, lose focus of actually being able to look at them. Uh, sometimes we get too smart for our own good. I usually uh, show a picture of some gentlemen that have this log that's literally this wide, this deep. The radius of it is that big. And they loaded it onto a cart and took it to town with mules. No power tools, no power equipment. Could my generation get that done? Well, I mean, we've forgotten how to do things that were done 100 years ago. We can't forget how to look at these things, too. People say, oh, you got the EPDs. Oh, they're great. They're, they're wonderful. But you still got to look at their feet. You still got to look at their legs. You still have to have them checked by a veterinarian. Is all the parts in the right place to be real general about it? So we're going to start with a little bit of just how do we look at cattle, okay? And this is, this is just, you'll never see this anywhere else, all right? But this is a good way to teach it really, really quickly. Divide your heifers or your yearling bulls into three sections, all right? A front, see a circle there, a middle circle, and a rear. If I fill in all three of those circles somewhat proportionately, I've got an animal that's balanced. And you might be thinking, why in the world does that matter to me? All right, I want my females to look like females. Right. If the females look like females, that's a greater opportunity for them to be fertile, to have babies on time, to be real general, year in, year out. If they've got that middle section filled up, that means they're probably going to keep their flesh better. Another opportunity for them to maintain the right body condition score to rebreed year in, year out. And if that rear circle is filled in like it should be, what's in that back part back there or should be back there? The muscle part. So... If that rear circle back there is not filled in, if there's a big void of, of mass of animal back there, I'm, I'm losing some muscle. So what does that look like? All right, looks like this. If I've got a buffalo that looks like uh, big and heavy fronted, that's not ideal, not very feminine. All right, so that is the, basically what we want to talk about. So I want to show you this real quick before we move down and, and uh, look at the cattle. So structure. If we've got all these column of bones here, if we've got them real straight, we have an animal that's walking on stilts versus an animal that should have just a little bit of angle in the shoulder, a little bit of angle in all these joints. None of us stand on, with our knees completely locked. Our knees are bent just a little bit, all right, to give us a little bit of cushion. If you stand there locked up like this, then you're probably going to eventually pass out. So you, you got to... You think about how you move. Everything has just a little bit of bend, a little bit of angle up front. It's not super rigid. The same thing with cattle. If we go out here and we see some cattle, which we're not going to hardly see any like this, but that are super straight and they're walking around like this, that's just not good for multiple reasons. All right. 
There's a bull. You can see he's got some angle to his shoulder. It's not straight up and down right here. He has a 45 degree angle here. You see that same angle tends to flow in other parts too, particularly back here at the, at the feet as well. I was thinking about trying to show you one more picture before we go out. All right. Hopefully you guys can see this. Can you guys see this okay? Is it the, looking into the sunlight kind of hard? You guys can see it okay? All right, let's do this real quick. You guys have done this before probably already, but let's, which animal on here has got the worst balance? If I do the three circles on each one of these, which one of these is the least proportionate in those three sections? Number one, two, three, or four? Uh-huh. Very good. Which, which uh, circle is the number one missing? The front, middle, or rear? Rear. So what am I missing? Muscle. Muscle. All right. You figured it out. I mean, in a nutshell, you figured out that we've got something missing there. And that also means that that number one heifer, she's deep up front. So what's that? Fat. Fat and poor design. She's like that buffalo earlier. So that's, that's winning half of the battle right there. And we'll go out here and look at these cattle. We'll begin to go through the process of looking at these cattle. And this might be a little more detailed than what you might need to do at home. So we're going to probably go a little bit above and beyond, but not necessarily. Uh, if you have a small farm, as uh, Dr. Noble said, a, a one bull farm, you know, the ones you do keep is pretty important. So if you got the time, look at them. If you got 200, you can't do this, right? Or you necessarily not like exist this exactly anyway. So... We've got tag numbers beside these cattle here, um, out here on the spreadsheet. Hopefully you've got the spreadsheet. And um, we're going to start out with just these two right here and look at them really quickly. It's not going to be super long or super in-depth necessarily. Yeah, he's going to pass out the sheet. So the sheet that uh, Mr. McCants is passing out there has some actual data on it. And I need to actually get one of those as well. Mr. McCants. So you look at the data, Jason? Well, not, I'm not looking at the data just yet, uh, but we can as we talk through them. Um, and it might be uh, that we need to get Mr. McCants' uh, interpretation on a couple of things. So before we start on that, what does priority mean? That was based on my looking at them, based on what I thought about. That's your rank. That's your rank. So you've already put the... You've already let the cat out of the bag. Uh, <laughs> so I tell you what, either he or I are going to be pretty close or we're not. Most likely we're going to be pretty close. I wish we hadn't given this sheet out because that kind of lets the cat out of the bag a little bit. If I didn't know what priority does, we'd have waited on this sheet. But I tell you what, it's fine. Absolutely fine. So let's just start with uh, number 20 there. This is number 20 closest to me here. Uh, just kind of give your assessment here. And the, the things I have on this blank sheet here, um, you, can, you can mark a check mark. You can write whatever note, good, bad, or nothing. You don't have to write anything necessarily. Um, if you see things that are good or bad, you can put them anywhere on this sheet. Because at the end, we're going to put this with our identity beef data and try to come up with ones that maybe we don't like as much. So this is number 20 here. Um, just as a, I guess to get us started, if you look at number 20, that'll be the, the under the column A, not the far left column, but column A, this heifer, uh, his average daily gain that he recorded was 2.17, which is outstanding. Um, you know, a winning weight was 647, again, outstanding. And um, he has the dam and all that as well. So it's nice to have some numbers for sure. You can see where she falls in line. This is still 20 right here, right? So 20 has a little bit of the brown tinge on her. Uh, let's just talk about some basics. Muscle. Is she, does she have enough muscle for an Angus breeding heifer? If you do the three circles, does she look like she's really devoid of muscle? No, she doesn't. She, she's okay. She's not just a really super thick heifer, but I don't really need a super thick heifer. That's not necessarily what I'm looking for. If we look at uh, volume, body volume, in her rib cage and in her flank and in her gut, does she look like she's good, bad, or indifferent? Does anything stick out to you as bad? If we do the three circles, looks like she's filled in pretty proportionately, uh, th thickness and body volume. She's actually got a good depth of rib, 
but she's also got spring of rib as well. Both those things combined give you know more of a total volume. And think about this. Why do they need to have volume? They need to be able to intake what you're giving them, forage of some kind and some feed maybe to go with it at times. And that they, the cattle that have more gut, generally speaking, hold their body conditions better versus cattle that are really tucked in their gut that look like a greyhound dog. They're really skinny middle dogs. You can feed them all the biscuits you want in the world. They're not ever gonna really look fat. And I'm giving you kind of a, a really general lame example there, but that's kind of how it looks like. Versus a basset hound dog that's just really wide and big barreled in its middle. And you can feed it two biscuits and it'll keep it going for six months, right? So the same thing applies with the body volume. We want to have appropriate body volume and she has that. She's got decent muscle, a decent body volume. All right, uh, let's look at her walk a little bit. I'm gonna put her across this back dealer. Look and see if she reaches up and steps her track. Anything noticeable bad about her? Or do you feel so uncomfortable you're not real sure? And I think that's what most people are like. I don't, I don't really feel comfortable with it. You know, we just saw a, a few steps out of her. You know, if they reach up and step, if they reach up and push off of either end, most of the time they're in pretty decent shape. You know, she's kind of, she's in decent shape. I don't see anything that's super rigid, right? But I also don't see an animal that reaches up under herself and just kind of does this right here. That's called uh, sickle hock, too much set to their hock. Uh, when you have those, sometimes if they get ridden, they might break down the hock, but more so from a bull standpoint, their hocks will break out and break down. Whether they're too straight or too angled like a dog leg, either one of those is not ideal. She's kind of in the middle. Now, is she perfect structured? No. And we're going to talk about, where's Mr. McCants? We're going to talk about some things now that don't matter about this heifer, all right? She's a little bit straight in her pasterns. She does a little bit of this on her, on, down at the bottom of her leg. She's a little bit straight. She's a little bit up on her toes. It's nothing major, all right? It's little stuff. So I want you to, to see the little stuff so that you can feel comfortable about it. I want you to compare these two. You know where dew claws are at? That little button just above their feet looks like a little mini horn, all right? The, this other heifer here, 20, that's, that's 20, she's okay. This the other heifer that's kind of straight in her pasterns. I, I wasn't looking at the right one. See how she's up on her turves a little bit? Now, it's gonna be more particular, uh, more easily seen on the far right rear one versus this one here. Uh, 63 is the one, I, I did confuse you on that. I was looking at the wrong heifer there. 20 is actually okay on that on that deal. I was looking at the wrong calf. Maybe we'll get to her in a minute. But they move just a little bit different there. One thing about 20, and hopefully I don't get you confused here too much, is she tends to hock in just a little bit, which isn't a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. But you see her go away from you, her hocks kind of point toward each other a little bit. Not a huge deal, not a big deal. So that 20 heifer, as a visual, she's fine. She has a little bit of extra neck to her. She might end up being a little bit heavy fronted, but she's a very nice heifer in general. Some people will get really critical about having some neck and some leather in their neck. That actually kind of bodes well for her fleshing ease, as long as it doesn't get any more than that. So the 20 heifer, yeah, she's got just a little bit of brisket and a little bit of neck, and some of that's because Mr. McCants has been feeding her pretty good. All right, yeah. So this heifer here, body condition wise, she's gonna be an easy six, you know, and uh, Mr. McCants does take care of his heifers very well. And Mr. McCants, you did say something there, maybe a little too much, and they, they've got plenty of feed. And right now it's hard to balance that because you're in a drought, you're, you're thinking about winter, and they're, if they're easy doing, it doesn't take a lot of feed to make them fat. And you kind of want that, but you don't want to let it get in the way of utter development and some of those things too. So it's a catch 22, we don't want to hold them back too much. Uh, I think she's, she's in great shape, but she's, she's one of those that might be one of the fatter ones in here. We will see. All right, so she's all right. Let's look at 63. Yeah, uh-huh. Well, as winter sets in, you're gonna to want to give her some supplement, um, depending on, you know, if you've got plenty of forage and there's plenty of good forage, yeah, that's one thing. But if you don't have that, you're gonna to have to give them some energy and protein otherwise. So if you've got hay tested, you can look at your hay test and say, this is what they're able to get here. Is this sufficient for a heifer that's going to be bred? And you can work with your extension agent, nutritionist, 
uh, whoever, uh, Dr. Whitley, or whoever you got on your nutrition you know, team with you, you can, I can look at my hay sample, this is what I've got, do I need to add anything to that to, meet any, to fill any gaps? Uh, she's gonna be fine with what you're doing right now. Okay. They eating you out of house and home? Okay, that's why kind of, the way you were talking there, that's kind of what I figured. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll defer to Dr. Jones on that. Okay, so so yeah, we've got heifers that are 12 months of age in a body condition six already, but there's a lot of of wiggle room, I guess, depending on the, the, the enterprise. But if you're going to breed in January, three months from now, you you could afford to back off a little bit. But the only thing you don't want to back off much because where you want in your heifers is you want to be moderate, moderate, moderate right before breeding. Yeah. So I would not change too much. You yeah. might want to just back this off just a smidgen. And, and then right before, just kick it up a notch and not much. Your heifers are absolutely gorgeous. I'm gonna speed us up quite a bit because we only got so much time in the day and we do have quite a bit to do. So we're gonna get kind of cowboy for a minute, all right? Number 20, I want you to learn this one detail. When she reaches up and steps her track or reaches up off either end and pushes, she does it well. But I also want you to look at this one other thing. She looks like a female. She has a maternal look to her, all right? Her front end, she has a little bit of skin on her neck, but she still looks like a lady. She still looks like a female and it all ties together pretty well. And some of that is aesthetics, but some of it actually can be translated to she's just good stock. The thing that we don't want to lose over time, remember 100 years ago, our, our parents, grandparents, they knew how to look at stock and they could tell which ones were going to be better mamas by how they look, by looking at them. To some degree, that's all they had, right? Now we got the genomics, but well, we can look at them too. We're going to look at these two heifers right here and tell which one looks more like a female. I want you to write down some of that stuff, what you think about that. And then we're gonna put the gen genomics with it and see if we're right. All right. She looks like a lady and she gets deeper as you go back. She's kind of deep right behind her shoulders, but she's really steady in her depth all the way through. Everything ties together, her neck to the top of her shoulders, her top line's good, her hip is level, but really good and appropriate. Now let's look at 63. First of all, is she good or bad or indifferent? You want to give, you know, is she a decent heifer? Is she worth looking at? Yes or no? I, I mean, I think she's worth looking at, but he's seeing some stuff already, and that's fine. I think she's worth looking at for sure. Has she got enough muscle? Yes, she's got enough muscle. Has she got appropriate body volume? Yes, she does. All right. And, you know, 20 is a little bit on the flatter side. She's got a little bit more rib shape to her, the 63 heifer. But you know what? There's a few things about this heifer that are just a little interesting. Um, she doesn't give me that maternal look of the other one. She's a, she's a pretty fronted heifer, but she's a little bit deeper in her shoulder. She doesn't balance out quite as well. Now, that's just my personal opinion. Somebody else may like her better. Now, what I really want to hone in on this particular heifer is, is when she walks, she does not step down on those rear two. This is the heifer I thought I was talking about earlier. She does not step down those rear two quite as effectively. And I'll try to get her go along this rail over here. When she steps out, you'll see her, she's just not as effective in how she handles those rear two. She's just, she doesn't feel comfortable. She doesn't look comfortable when she's doing it. Is that being hypercritical? Probably so, all right? She's a little straight back in her patterns. Is that a big deal? Am I gonna call her based on that alone? Probably not, but we're learning to look at cattle. Is she still a good heifer? She's absolutely still a good heifer. We're being hypercritical. She is very good. So when I say something negative about one, that doesn't mean that she's gonna be the cull. We're just picking up and learning. I do not like how she walks off her rear two. Can she still have calves? Can she still raise calves? She can. Uh, is that gonna be something problematic down the road? It doesn't, it doesn't give me extra confidence, right? And I look at her feet. Looking at 20's feet real quick, at a, at a quick glance, her feet look like all of those point straight forward. This heifer here, I think most of that applies as well. But sometimes, guys, I'm going to give you a little extra bonus here. You don't have to pay any extra for it. Sometimes on those heels, so you got a foot there, right? The foot sitting there on a, on, a, on a flat surface, let's imagine. The back part of that foot, there should be some heel back there that's about this deep. But if you take the heel out and you make it shallower, 
what that does is it causes the toe to grow longer. And those cattle, their toes grow so long that they end up crossing over sometimes and you end up having to cull or trim those feet, which is not practical, right? So you have to watch, it's little details, right? And you're not gonna sit there and look at the depth of hill every one of your cows, all right? Don't do that. But we're looking at heifers, you can just pick up on it quick. Ah, her feet don't really like that. If I don't need her, ship her. Now this 63 heifer, does she have enough depth of hill? She probably does. But there are a couple of things in there that I just don't quite like. I don't know if I can really explain it. She's a little bit awkward on the way she sets her feet. Her toes are growing just a nickel long, but nothing major. Um, even this 20 heifer here, I look at her toes dead on. Her right front uh, cloth set, they tend to go together just a little bit up front. Is it gonna be a problem? Hopefully not for a few years. But that, I, I said her toes went straight. I was looking at all of them except that right front. And, uh, you know, is it a problem? Probably not. Again, Mr. McCants, we're being hypercritical. Do not be concerned. You're, you're, I don't want you walking through here today and saying, man, all my cattle are terrible. No, they're great cattle. And, and the things that I say, you may not see them, and that's fine too. What we got here are, here's the positives. We got heifers here that have been produced correctly. They're in the right body condition score. Maybe just a nickel fat, but we'll take it. It's okay, all right? I'd rather have them a nickel fat, meaning that means they can probably get fat. If I've got cattle that are being fed and they look a little thin, we got a problem. So at least these cattle are easy doing. They're easy flashing. Why are they easy flashing? Because their size is right. They got the body volume. And they have the genetics for it. All right, let's move on. So let's look at 11. Mr. McCann's sheet here on number 11. Remember, be in the right column. 11 is 11 this time. She's a, you know, a high gainer. Um, she's got a high winning weight. Uh, Mr. McCants has already marked her up in the top end of, her, of his deal, and uh, I would say he's dead on on that one. She's, from what I'm seeing here, she's got muscle, she's got body volume, and she's got plenty of it. Does she look like a female? Look at her right there. I mean, she's nice. That is a nice effort because she's got shape and she's got power and she looks like a female. Her neck still looks feminine. Her front end looks feminine. Why am I worried about that? Because that femininity translates to fertility, or it should most of the time in general. I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Jones or whoever check her. I'm gonna have my identity beef scores, but mostly I'm, at the end of the day, if she breeds, you know, that's the, that's the deal. But I, if I see a heifer that looks like a buffalo up front, I may not wanna worry about developing her. I may not be worried about keeping that particular heifer. She's not worth my time. This one right here is a nice heifer. Uh, look at her rear, rear view there. She's square, nice at her hip, all these little details that we could talk about. But in general, she's nice. Now, she's not standing too wonderfully there because she's better than that. She, she is the prototypical nice Angus hip female. Some people will say that she might be a little bit short all over. I can put the growth framey bull on them. And I've got a, a moderately sized cow that's going to save me some money on my inputs. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now I look at number 11. Uh -huh. I see her growing up in the back, and I look at the, the one across the head. She looks flat. Is that, am I looking at something? Are you talking about she's she kind of growing up in the back? There is a little bit in, in how their shoulder is set and that kind of thing. Um, she's probably a little bit weak in her top back there. So if there's a lack of muscle, you're gonna generally see a little bit of a dip in their back. It, so the one on the right, she's designed a little bit different and she's a little bit stronger in her back, but it's probably so uh, minor, it's not gonna matter a bunch, but I like how you're picking up on stuff for sure. Um, so that 11 heifer, the one on the far side over, let's watch her walk real quick. She reaches up and steps her track out here on these rocks beautifully, beautifully. I mean, she's reaching and she's pushing off of either end. If they're not reaching, that means they're too straight. If they are reaching but not pushing, that means they got dog legs. They're just, they're just going in one direction. That's forward. They're not actually pushing. She is a beautiful, beautiful heifer. I love that one. This right here is a knockout heifer from a purebred Angus standpoint. You know, if you, if you somebody may say, I, she doesn't fit my scenario because she's not enough frame. I got you. Uh, she may not fit my scenario because of this or that. Uh, that's fine. But here at Mr. McCant's place, uh, but what he's doing and what he's been breeding, she is solid as they come. Now let's move on to the other heifer. What tag number you got, Mr. Handy? 
Oh, 18. When I look at this particular heifer here, when I first saw her, I'm like, she's good. Uh, 18, 18. So she's 239, she's six inches, she's fifth priority. So he does like her. She's a rock star, that heifer. Just to look at her, she's like smoking good. If you get heifers that look like this right here from a, a visual evaluation standpoint, remember, we still got to do what Dr. Jones is talking about. We still can, you know, we got to still see if they're going to breed and all that. Just to visually look at them, these are $2,200, $2,300, $2,400 heifers all day long right now, at least, at, at least until two weeks ago at Adesto. These things are stingers. You put papers on these things and, you know, they're $3,500 heifers. Now, uh, tag, what's the tag number on that one over there? That's the 18 heifer. Um, she, let's look at her move. Reach up, push. She doesn't push as well off her rear too when she pushes. Nothing major though. I mean, she's just, you know, nothing major at all. She doesn't just feel, look super stout and strong. You see every once in a while she'll pop a knuckle on those, uh, on those rear feet. But she's got plenty of muscle thickness, plenty of stoutness. Man, I like that heifer. I would like to see her feet, um, if I can get a good look at them. And this might be a deal where we can get them in the chute. You know, some of their feet, I'd like to see just a squared up and going straight, just a little bit better straight ahead, but they're nothing major right now going on with them. All right, let's, let's get two more, Mr. Handy. Any questions on these guys? Those might be two of the best heifers we see. If we see another one better than those two, we've really got ourselves in for a treat today. And I, when you hear me bragging like that, I'm not playing. Not at all. All right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now we got to put our cowboy hats on, guys. We just saw two humdingers. I'm talking nice. Now let's look at these guys. We've got tag number 50. I'm going to try to get in the right column this time, guys, Dr. Noble. we got tag number 50 on the far side and tag number 16. 46, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. 46. Let's focus on the higher or the lower number, number 46, the heifer on my right, your right. Let's look at her real quick. Do the three circles. What have we got? She have enough muscle? She's... She's probably in the middle. Somebody said that, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, let's look at her on body volume. Come on this side over here for just a second, Mr. Handy. Um, maybe they'll walk around that corner just a little bit. She is, if you do the three circles, she's lighter on muscle than the other ones. And I can also see that she tends to hock in and she has her back legs up underneath her just a little bit as uh, a part of all that. Um, you know, does she have adequate body volume? Does she have enough middle to her? She does. Is she, she has less than most of the heifers we've seen. She's a little bit flatter, and this is how this works. She has a little less muscle, thus she's a little bit flatter ribbed. And um, is she gonna keep her flesh as easy as the other ones we had? In general, she's not gonna keep her flesh as easily as the other ones. Is she just as fat today? Yes, because Mr. McCants is feeding her. You turn them out on grass and see how they do, she's gonna have the hardest time getting rebred after that first calf in general because she's less stout in general she has less muscle she has less body volume now i uh, see mr kendy overlooking at the uh the data uh she ranked ninth under mr mccants i think i actually got it right this time and she's a little one of those that's a little bit u-necked meaning her, her neck attachment's low and people say that's aesthetic it's more than aesthetics to me good cattle are designed well and look at it right there it just doesn't fit like those other ones She's a little bit lower in her neck attachment. Her hip, to, her hooks to uh, pins is a little bit down, and her her rear legs. She's a little has a little extra set to her hock. See how she stands there. Let me turn her back here. Watch her walk. She she doesn't push a lot. She does a lot of reaching because she can. She's not going to push a lot. And you can also see that um, eh, just how she's designed through that shoulder isn't too bad. She's a little bit straight on her shoulder. I want you to watch her move when she, it's just nothing real bad though. She's a little bit straight in her scapula and her shoulder blade. So when she reaches with her front feet, she doesn't do it a lot. She just kind of does one of these a little bit. 
And then the back legs, she's just, she's just putting them up underneath herself, but she's not really ever extending too much. This is hypercritical. This is not something you're gonna do on your farm every day, but watch her move there. So things just don't add up with her. And you might put that in your notes there. So 46, she's a fine heifer. I'd say that most places in the world will be glad to have this heifer. We're being hypercritical. She's quite fine in many aspects. All right, let's look at 50. If we can get, 46's temperament's not all there either. Mr. McCants don't like her. I made him keep her, I think. Because I wanted to keep back a few to be critical on. He's like, I don't want to keep that. I was like, Mr. McCants, we need to keep a few back that we can talk about. <laughs> all right, number 50 here. This little fuzzy haired heifer. You know what? She's, the only problem with number 50 is, is that she's following two stinger heifers over here. Otherwise, if we just saw her first, I'd be bragging on her like nobody's business. She's well balanced. She's got body volume. She's got adequate muscle thickness. She has a little extra set to her hock. Let's see if we can get her to move around. A little extra set. She's a little up under herself. Has a, and her hocks tend to come in just a little bit. Again, that's not gonna really affect her a lot from a functionality standpoint. It's just being, I'm getting, I'm talking about things that aren't super important, but she does hock in just a little bit. Let's get a good look at her right there. You'll see that her hocks from the rear should be pointing straight back, but hers do this right here. And it's not a big deal. All that does is really just kind of tell me about her stoutness. She doesn't quite have the stoutness of some of the other ones, but she is a nice heifer. Watch her move. See how she doesn't really push a lot when she strides either. Again, perfectly fine heifer. Let's get two more. We're gonna roll through them. Oh, we got so just a little bit of growth difference. Some of the data here, number 24, I get to the right column. Um, she's two pounds a day and uh, weaned at 656. And uh, Mr. McCants thought she was the middle of the pack. She's a little bit more moderate and smaller for some. I don't mind moderate as long as they breed and give me a calf every year. I can breed them to a bull. Um, we'll look at 68. She's gonna be a little bit on the adverse of that. Um, she's gonna be a little bit growthier. She is the heaviest winning weight heifer of the group. And he's got her as number one. Why does Mr. McCants have her ranked number one overall? What are you trying to do? You're trying to make him grow. You want growth, right? Because you know that pounds pay. Now on your heifers, pounds don't necessarily pay directly. Now they will to the calf and the next generation, but am I getting a live calf out of that heifer? is the key, right? Is she gonna cost me more to keep her through the winter? So these are additional questions, right? So it's, if 68 is the highest performing one, she may or may not be your best heifer. And it, we're not trying to rank them at, your, at home. We're just trying to say, you know, ultimately, are these quality animals I wanna keep? We're talking about it just from, a, I guess, an educational standpoint. When I look at that heifer, I say, man, she's pretty nice. But I also want to compute in my head over time, if I continually do what Mr. McCants is doing, or Mr. McCants continues to do what he's doing, I'm gonna only pick the highest growth ones, you're gonna end up with a lot of elephants in your pasture. Elephants cost more to feed than cows, all right? So Mr. McCants' females now aren't too big, but if he does it for three more generations, he's gonna have some elephants. That's just how that works. If I'm gonna pick the highest growth animals in my herd all the time, and I'm gonna keep breeding them to high growth bulls, and I'm always gonna keep my high growth heifers, they're gonna weigh 1,800 pounds. And you're thinking, Jason, there ain't no way. I see them where I work. We, our average herd, purebred Angus herd weight is 1,650. 1,650, now his aren't that big yet. His are the right size, but they'll get there. Why, because you've chosen for them, you selected for them. By intention or not, you, you chose them. Now 68, is she good? She's smoking good. Am I gonna keep her? Absolutely, doggone lootly, I'm gonna keep that heifer. But I'm not gonna keep her just because she ranks number one on growth. I'm gonna keep her because she's dadgum good. And she's smoking good. Now, if she don't breed, she's terrible. So she's good until we have that breeding day, right? That's gonna be the proof in the pudding. Or if Mr. Uh, Dr. Jones puts you the shoot and says, hmm, one of these horns ain't like the other, <laughs> so to speak, you know, something's not right at the rectal palpation, then she's not worth a, a nickel either. And sometimes you'll see that. Sometimes, oh, I love that heifer. She looks real good. Well, eh, it's really what matters fertility-wise, right? And sometimes these ones that stands out 
have have um, got some other stuff going on. Sometimes these really fast growers end up not doing what they should fertility wise. But sometimes they do. You just don't know. I look at that heifer there and I like her quite a bit. I'm gonna move her around. She's special. She's special to Mr. McCants because she's so high performing. Is she gonna be the biggest cow out here in three or four years? Yeah, she is. Which one's gonna eat the most? Is she gonna win me the biggest calf? I don't know. I hope she does, but there's no guarantees. Big cows don't mean big calves. They don't. I can I can give you the data to show that. Now, uh, let's look at the other heifer, the micro heifer. By comparison, I'm giving you the biggest one and almost the littlest one here at the same time. 24. Anything wrong with that heifer, guys? Only thing wrong with that heifer is she's a little shorter than the other one. Some people get real critical about that. She don't bother me. Now, when uh, Dr. Jones does the pelvic area, is she gonna meet 140 square centimeters or centimeter square? I don't know. So let's put a note on that one there. What's her tag number again, 24? Yeah, let's get that one in there for Dr. Jones to do a pelvic area on. I like her, but she pelvic area may not be there. Just don't, just looking at her overall size, and I can look at her hip and see that at the pin, she's just a little bit narrow. Uh, and she might not be, he might get in there and say, oh gosh, Duggan, she's 160 centimeters. We've got to have something to learn about today, right? Um, most likely she's going to be quite fine. Mm-hmm. Yep. So these are the pins right here on either side of that tail, right there on each side of the, the rectum. I like both those heifers. Don't see anything major wrong with them. They're just two different sides of the scale there. They don't push off those rear two too terribly well, but nothing to really get them. I tell you what, guys, we got a heifer there closest to you. What's her tag number? Do you guys get that? Is it number one? Okay. Number one on your data sheet. She is a heifer that's growing just fine. She's on the lower scale for average daily gain, but her winning weight is fine. Um, she is super nice. So let's look at number one here, guys. She is a female that looks like a female. She's got a beautiful design to her. She reaches up and pushes off either end. She's probably my favorite overall phenotypically just looking at them. If not really close to those other two that we had earlier that I was really bragging on. I love number one, her build, her stoutness is appropriate. Um, her body volume is appropriate. When she reaches up here, guys, and steps her track, She's really good structurally. If I could replicate her, man, oh man, I'm in business. Look at her setup. Her, her neck and head are beautiful. She looks like a female and she just comes back and she's got that top is strong. Uh, Hanny was talking about the top on another one. Her top is still strong enough. Her hip is still good enough. That number one heifer is stinger good. And I'm not just saying that because we're here at Mr. McCann's farm. She's stinger good. On the, you talking about their claws, that, the feet? I want them straight ahead as best I can get them. That's what you call a claw set. So a five on a claw set scale. You can look at the Angus Journal, just uh, Google Angus uh, foot scoring poster, and it'll give you all the stuff that you need on that. And the Angus EPDs for foot uh, claw set and foot angle are based on five to nine, meaning uh, they only use half the scale, but we, won't, we can get on that later if you want to. Particularly in these heifers that haven't been pushed a whole lot, uh, you're going to need to watch the feet because that is going to be something that for themselves, as they go throughout their productive life, it may shorten their longevity, right? So if I've got cows that only, they, they've got foot problems at four years of age, I've lost my money because as Mr. McCann said, oh, it takes five years, at, at least four, to pay back on what you've invested. So, and then if you're going to keep daughters out of them, you know, or if you've got a breeding situation or a purebred situation, bulls, you don't want those foot issues. It is, there is some heritability for sure. Now let's look at this other heifer. What's her tag number? An afterthought. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, she's not as good as the other heifers, most of them. There's nothing super wrong. Most people would, would really benefit from having a heifer like that. She's just a little bit flatter, a little bit plainer. She's a little bit, uh, she's less feminine up front. She looks a little more staggy and bully up front. Uh, we won't talk about her a whole lot, but hopefully you can see that she's just not 
uh, put together as well as the others. She's got, you know, the basic parts and builds. I love her design. I love the way she's made. Um, you know, she has a lower winning weight, thus uh, Mr. McCants does not like her. I love her. I love her. Now, if she'll milk and breed, then I really love her. I'm not as worried about growth as I am. Do I have a functional female? Here, the only thing I'm going to teach you today is don't be too hard on your heifers, Mr. McCants. So there's Mr. McCants number 39 right here. So 39 there. At a glance on this particular heifer here, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing atrociously wrong with this heifer. She's solid all the way around. She's probably not as stout as some of the other ones. She's a little bit lighter bone than the other ones. Um, but she's a, she's a really nice, complete kind of heifer. Um, she's a little shorter faced. Some people might be a little, you know, questioning how big she's going to be or got enough frame for them. But from a female standpoint, she's quite fine for me in a pure Angus situation. She, I don't like her hip structure as well. That's getting super critical. She's just a little bit low in her pin set. So you think about where her hooks are at right there. She tends to roll off of her hip. And that's probably the biggest phenotypic thing I see wrong with her. Is that a huge deal? Not necessarily. There's 34, guys. At a quick glance, being super quick, this heifer's a little bit lighter boned, but she's got all the, the basic parts and pieces. I like the, the heifer in general. She's not got as much uh, rear rib and flank to her, not quite as much stoutness to her. 34. In general, she's fine. A nice, complete heifer. A lot of people would be blessed and, you know, loved to own. I can't, I'm unfortunately, I can't be too hard on him. I'm, thinking, I'm thankful he kept that one heifer. It's a little bit of a knothead because we wouldn't have a lot to talk about. Um, Cause she's well-made. She's got body volume. She doesn't have as much rear rib and flank. Um, she's not quite as stout, but she's a pretty heifer. I have a question about the uh, average daily gain. In the middle is what I would say. So the, the, the highest average daily gain heifer here, that doesn't mean she's going to have the, the highest winning weight heifer. It does not mean that necessarily. Um, now, I would say that, that there is a, there's always going to be a genetic correlation to some degree, right? But there's no guarantees. But I can also go to the other side. If I get a low winning weight heifer, um, the chances of her having a low winning weight calf is fairly high, right? What I want to do is most of the time shoot in the middle, particularly if my cows are already big enough. Mr. McCants doesn't have big cows right now, but he will soon. He will soon because he's been pushing that growth, which there's nothing wrong with that. You just got to be aware of your input cost on those cows. Because when you do have 1,600 pound cows versus a 1,200 pound cow, they're going to eat, and I forget the exact numbers, but they're going to need about seven or eight more pounds of feed a day. That's forage and everything. So you, you must play that out throughout the winter. That counts for something. So is my 1,600 pound cow, is my 1,600 pound cow going to uh, wean a 70 pound heavier calf? Probably not. Generally speaking, it's gonna be the average. You've got the smallest purebred Angus herd in the whole state of Georgia, I can promise you, because most of them weigh 14. But I tell you what, and, and you go another generation or two, guess what yours are gonna weigh? And there's nothing wrong with that if you like feeding cows. <laughs> I just play, I just play. All right, let's move on. Uh, I've spent enough of your time. We had a lot of heifers. I would say guys that on this particular heifer here, She's got a, her, her left front foot, paw set, is starting to come together a little bit, nothing major, but uh, I don't like that. Come on here and you can look at her handy. She, if you get a dead on look at that, her left front foot. Let's pull out a few that uh, Dr. Jones can uh, palpate and look at, guys. A difference in management because we know that I'm measuring today, she's gonna calve in 12 months, and that growth between today and, and when she calves matters as much. Uh, about whether or not she's going to, and when I say growth, I'm talking about her growth, her overall frame development. The calf growth does matter, but if I've used a, a low birth weight bull with a calving ease direct CEB, the EPD that says CEB, that's double digits, then I'm going to have a better chance of not having any calving problems. And so there's not a lot of people that use this technology, but I think it has value, especially talking today. Now, the heifers that we do want to remove from the program are the ones that are infertile, they're subfertile, and then the heifers that have issues with their pelvis. Their, their pelvis is either too small today or 
the, uh, there's some odd shape. And that happens. I remember uh, some, a farmer brought a heifer, to, or a heifer to meet a calf, and there's a, there's a little, at the bottom of the pelvis, there's something called a, the pelvic symphysis, and it actually protruded up this high. And if you feel inside of a heifer, either when you're AI and or you're trying to help one calf, you feel the bottom of the pelvis, you'll feel a little ridge. And it protruded up this high. And that was the only thing keeping that calf from being delivered. And so if, I, if we'd have been able to pelvis examine her beforehand, you know, so, but that's an oddity. Um, but I just want to mention that sometimes we can run into misshaped pelvis. So the other thing that I'm doing is I'm palpating a track. Okay. Now, so traditionally uh, the, the track score is a one to five. One being immature. Uh, she, she just not reached puberty yet and five being cycling, four and five are essentially the same. There's a, a publication from Kansas State that has a what they call a ready, intermediate, and problem. So the, the ones that are uh, immature and number one, they fall into problem. They also, the ones that are typically lighter and typically younger. So there's an age factor, there's an age, weight, and breed factor to puberty. The Angus and Hereford, those kind of crosses, a lot of our, our um, English breeds, they typically, Durham, the shorthorn, they typically reach puberty at a younger age. Whereas our, our continental breeds, Charlet, Limousine, uh, or our Zebu cross cattle typically mature later. So um, no matter what I do, uh, they're, gonna, they're, they're not gonna mature until 15 to 18 months of age. Wagyu, uh, Wagyu will mature early, typically, um, but uh, you know they're they're kind of the outlier of the beef because they have some traits that are a little bit different than the than the the Taurus or, or the Zebu, but because uh, their their selection has been you know marbling and and but but they as a rule they typically will reach puberty on the same. At, at the same rate as, as like Angus cattle. Um, but um, so uh, people have used Wagyu on heifers sometimes for a smaller calf and, and that's a benefit for sure. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna palpate the track, I'm gonna measure. This is called a pelvimeter and there's an arrow here. It's got a centimeter scale right here. And, and what I will do is I'll go inside the heifer and I'll squeeze this and this will, I'll take my fingers inside and it'll be right next to it. So what I'm gonna to try to do, this part will do at the, the bottom of the backbone, okay? The, the spine, and you know the spine has vertebrae. So I'm gonna measure at the bottom and not in between the vertebrae there. And then this is gonna be right on that little ridge at the bottom of the pelvis. So it's gonna measure this. I'm gonna guide it with my fingers to make sure that I'm right there. And then I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna look at what this is. So it's, it's set in centimeters and half centimeters. So I kind of go to the closest half. Then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna go up. So the pelvis shape is like an upside down egg. And then I'm gonna try to get the highest point that I can. And I'm gonna try to determine that width, okay? Why? Because that's where the calf's shoulders are coming through. The bottom of the pelvis is where the chest is coming through. And if you notice this, if you look at a calf when it's coming out in the diving position, it is shaped like an upside down egg. It's a perfect fit for that birth canal. So I'm looking, is there enough room for those shoulders to come through the birth canal? And that's what I'm looking for. So then we're going to take those two measurements. We're going to multiply them. It's called centimeter squared, but you know and I know that's not square, right? But we're using that fact, that, that calculation to factor in 30 years ago, they said, okay, we're gonna divide by two. If she's 140, then she should be able to handle a 100 and, uh, or a 70 pound calf because we divided by two. It's not that precise, didn't come close. Um, but as a rule of thumb, heifers that have a wider pelvis area typically have fewer calving problems. But just like Jason mentioned, we gotta be careful because if all I select for is big pelvis area, what also comes with that? Bigger heifers. So 
I have to be, I have to be careful there and, and make sure that I'm using some moderation. Everything Jason said about uh, using the the using the data and using everything in moderation with the with some some common sense applies to this as well. So, any questions before we get started? And I'll try to run through them fairly. Um, yeah, I'll talk about it as we're as we're going through the heifers. Um, of course, what you're going to see is uh, somebody in green coveralls, you know, with their arm in a heifer. That's about all you're going to see. So most people don't. Once I get a little lube or some manure on my hand, most people don't like me to reach and grab handles and stuff because the next person behind me has just a little stuff on their hand. So, so anyway, I introduced the pelvimeter. I find my landmarks inside there. And so the height on her is 14 centimeters. And then I'm measuring inside the pelvis and the width on her is 10 centimeters. And then I'm palpating the reproductive tract. Um, her tract feels, feels prominent. The horns feel really good. I'm hoping everybody knows you're uh, seeing the anatomy of a, and, um, she has a uh, she has a medium sized follicle, and so that makes her a track score of three. So um, based on her trajectory with the uh, gain and all, I think that she'll be fine, especially since she's going to be AI'd in January. So she's on track. Okay, so the other thing with her that, so if I'm looking here at the tail head, she's already had somebody riding her, um, so we know she's already cycling. That's another sign. If you have any questions about whether or not they're cycling your heifers, you can always take those rub, those patches that you put on there and just put on the back. Now, heifers are uh, curious animals, and they, you know, if they're bored, they're going to mess with each other and anything odd like patches or cedars or anything like that they're going to definitely so i have to do a little bit of cleaning out to make room for my hand and the instrument i introduce the pelvimeter find my landmarks um, so she is 13 height and the width is is 11 so even though she's a little bit shorter in height, if you do the math, the first one was 10, was 14 by 10. This one's 13 by 11. How much difference between square centimeter? Not much. Because 13 by 11 is 143. And 10 by, and 10 by 14 is 140. So see, even though they can be a little different shape, but they're still the same pelvis area, effectively. She's got a large follicle, huh? This is 11 by 13. 13, 13 high, 11 wide. And she's a, she's a four, you know, four and five are cycling. That's consistent with the signs I'm seeing. So I also, because of her size, I caught a little blood. I'm just pointing that out. That's not a big concern. It's, it's superficial blood like a scratch. Ten and a half wide, so she's plenty big. Her track uh, horns are horns are nice. They're you know approximately mid size. Some development here, so you can tell that a lot of this is just depending on my experience, and this is a little bit subjective based on my experience. Two of us might come in here. We're going to be close, but we're not in a hundred percent agreement. I'm going to. I'm going to go ahead and call her a three. I was a little surprised I was expecting her to be a four or five just by feel, but um, I don't, there's nothing, nothing of concern at all. She feels really good for her age. Okay, so she's 13 high. Yep. 
11 wide, kind of like a pretty consistent, aren't they? Okay, and so she is cycling. She's a five, even though I don't see any rub. Okay, so I'll find my landmarks here. Uh, she's got a good clamp on my hand. Uh, she's 13 and a half high. 10 and a half wide. Somebody got a calculator on their phone, want to calculate that? So her track's a little smaller, but her ovary activity is good. Um, she's got what feels like possibly a, a medium-sized follicle on the right. And follicle is the... Um, Cows naturally have follicles that grow and regress. Some will call her a three as well. Okay, so, yeah, so on, I, I did this one a little out of order, but on, on track score, she's a five. And she's 13 high. Eleven wide. Find my landmarks. Okay, so she's going to be a, just a smidgen smaller, 12 and a half is her height. Ten and a half wide is her width. Whoops, I forgot to palpate, sorry. You can go ahead and measure, Dr. No, if you want. Hopefully I'm not going to make her squat or anything too bad. Um, so if you guys have got some of your notes that you took, I know it's probably at least one of you did, Mr. McCants I know did, um, you'll help me guide along here and they put that with the paper that we're going to look at here and we're going to merge it a little bit. So all these numbers here come from uh, getting a TSU sample and I should have brought one of those out here and I failed to do so but they're in my truck. Uh, basically I, I got a little kit that you Put up, that's like you're tagging a calf, and you tag that calf, but in this case, it, it puts a little piece of that ear, the, the punch, ho punch out hole of that ear inside of a little tube of solution. And we sent that off to Neogen. They give you these scores for IGNDB for those uh, 12 different traits. Probably more than that, actually. I forget if it's 12 or 16. But anyway, you get all those traits there for each one of these heifers. Now, how this works, the higher number, the better for most of the traits, with the exception of birth weight and with the exception of RFI, which we might, we might not even talk about RFI. It's probably not worth getting all confused about because we might just hit on it a little bit. But everything else, the higher number is generally positive for the most part, okay? So let's look at just the heifers in general. Let's look at BW, birth weight, okay? Your birth weight data here. As long as we don't see anything way off the charts, we're not really going to worry about it. most of these numbers are right here in the middle. We do have a th couple of threes. I'm not personally worried about those. Um, you know, as long as those birth weights don't align with a low pelvic score, we probably should be okay. Uh huh. You're fine. Well, that's probably the way we need to look at it. Yes, it's a little bit like EPDs. Yes, and I've had the threes. I had threes. Threes is fine. I don't know why I had my back I'm backwards on that. So the lower number, obviously, is going to be um, more advantageous from a birth weight standpoint. But I would not worry about this, particularly on heifers. And yeah, thinking about calves, that's kind of how you look at it, right? But there is a genetic case for that as well, because we're going to look at stability, and we're thinking about stability for these particular animals. So it's both. It's both. It's what she is and what she's going to pass along as well. So it's both, but we can look at it like, like EPDs. And he's got the, uh, a little cheat sheet here for everybody here. Uh, it gives you a breakdown on all this stuff, right? So uh, like it says here, higher score equates to higher birth weight potential. Heavier calves can cause calving difficult. We know those. But, so on this deal here, birth weights, as long as we don't see like nines and tens, let's move on. 
CED, that stands for calving ease direct. So uh, the shape of the calf is how I look at it. So we have birth weight, but the shape of the calf is plugged into the CED. It puts a little bit of birth weight along with the calving ease scores that are recorded through breed associations. And so they have the genetic markers for potential, for ones that should come out easier. They're gonna shoot out. Instead of having broad, wide shoulders and, and big hooky hips, they're gonna be coming out just a little bit easier, less awkward shape, if you will. So as long as we don't see anything that's like a uh, one or a two, we should be in good shape. I don't see any problems there. All those cattle look very good. He's been breeding Angus calving ease for years. and It's no shock that um, there's not a calving ease issue here. Uh, CEM, how the daughters will do in terms of calving ease. So the same thing applies, the higher number the better. As long as we don't see one, twos, or threes, we're projecting if we keep daughters out of these particular heifers, how they're gonna calve. All these are like very, very good. There's a five in here, which I'm not worried about it, right? Uh, he's, he's gonna use the bull mating part of it too. So as long as I don't see one, twos, or threes, we're good. So the thing about Mr. McCant's data here is there's not a lot to really pick on. It's just what you see, that's the, how it works. The cattle look good. The data generally looks good. All right, and we could, we've only tipped the iceberg on a lot of this stuff, but it's not, it's not a surprise that I get Mr. McCann's data back and you're like, yeah, that's what I see when I look at them. But there's a reason why we, we pay the money for this. All right, so we're gonna get that here in just a second. Let's get on to heifer pregnancy. Now, when I saw this heifer pregnancy column, I was like, wow, these things score well, and I mean way above average. You talking about three of them being nines and three of them being tens? Uh, and you got eights? I mean, if I had a pen of sevens and eights, I'd be like, wow, that's great. No, I mean, he's got nines and tens. So I'll read you the deal here so you can be more better explained than me doing it. A heifer's potential to conceive during breeding season relative to other heifers. A higher value is desired. Desired. So it's her potential for breeding as a heifer. He's, he's, I mean, topping it out. You cannot get better than what these cattle are today, period. It's like crazy impressive. That's compared to all of the Angus genetics that are tested out there. So we can move on. We have nothing to say about uh, heifer pregnancy, the HPR, except that it's all great. Now milk, uh, we do have a little bit of discussion we could have here, uh, but let me ask you the question, Mr. Kent, do you have any problems with your cows milking? Okay, so does it, do we see that here on the paper? We do I see a little bit, okay? But here's the thing about milk. I don't want to ever get too carried away with milk. More milk, more money, all right? Because they're going to cost more feed, and are they going to rebreed, all right? So if those heavy milking cows, if they're pouring that milk, they're going to take the body energy off of their bodies. They're going to get thin, and they might be hard to rebreed. So can Mr. McCants use a little more milk? Possibly, but we don't want to go too far with it. Because is the heifers bad? No. Is his winning weights bad? Nope. So we don't want to get crazy about this. We can just see right here, there's a couple here, uh, particularly number one, you're like, eh, I don't like that. Uh, he might can go back and look at her dam and say, well, she milks okay for me. And he may not worry about that. But that number two on the milk, it's a little low. Then you've got uh, number 39, she's a three. And then the bottom one, 68, she's a, a three. So I'm not super pumped about them. I'm gonna just kind of flag it, and that's what I did there in your sheet. I just kind of put a little flag on it to give me a, a way to go back and look. Is this, is this a heifer I need to go back and look? So that's why I took number one, and I put a box around it, and I put a red two. That was just to demonstrate for today. And so those are question marks for me. Now, number one, how was she when we looked at her? How, how good was she? Yeah. She's smoking good, right? So it's, it's going. She's got low milk. So I have to determine is that milk on this thing and what I see from her mother really valid. She weighed up the heaviest in the whole group. So if I really got a problem, ah, maybe, maybe. But I'm not too worried about it. I'm not gonna cull my best heifer. And she's not too big, she's just right, even though she is the biggest. I'm not gonna cull my best heifer on this number two, but I'm gonna question it and I'm gonna watch it. Cause it may be that she comes back and she doesn't have enough milk. If you've got too many heifers to select from, I may not keep that number two, but if he wants to keep 10, I'm gonna keep one. Where are you going to say? It would for the next generation, but it not for that, not for her right then. It's gonna help you set goals. And that could be in breeding herds. It could be, I mean, how you 
purchase bulls or how you call, but both could apply. Absolutely, that's a great point. If you're going to be keeping your own daughters. If you're not going to be keeping your own daughters, you know, you may not be worried about this milk, uh, EPD, uh, as much. You're going to go buy it, you know. I say EPD. It's a, kind of an EPD. So the one thing I'll conclude with milk on is don't worry about getting too much milk. It will cost you money. My dad was a tremendous man, a tr tremendous stockman, but he loved big udders too much. I mean, we had like quarter blood Holsteins and a little bit of brown Swiss. I'm like, Daddy, yes, you got tons of milk, but they're only breeding every 13 months. And I didn't tell him that. You shut your mouth, right? But um, I was like, Daddy, you know, I don't know if this is working out, having a calf every 13 months. But he had lots of milk, right? But there's a cost to it, and you have to balance it. We want it right in the middle. Uh, let's look at stability. So if there's anything to learn from this sheet here, it would be this. This is where I'll, I'm like, man, this is the best data I've ever seen on a group of heifers in my life, which I haven't looked at a lot of this, but I looked at enough to know that this is special. But then I look at stability, and I'm like, hmm. Is there there's something going on here? And it could be, simply put, that they're Angus. They're just Angus. All right? They're just Angus compared to all the heifers that have been tested on this platform. All right? And Angus are tremendous cows. They're wonderful cows. No breed is perfect, and they have a shorter lifespan, period. They just do. You get, you get Angus cows that, list, that live beyond 10 uh, production years-wise, I mean 10 years of age and still producing, they're pretty special. They don't go much past 11, 12 years old, particularly. 12 years old, you're like, man, they're like walking around dead. Past. Now, you get a Hereford Angus Cross, well, she'll go, she'll go 14 pretty quick. Most of the time, I'm speaking in generalities. You get a Red Angus, she's going to go 12, 13 years pretty easy. But a Black Angus, she's not, not generally speaking. Um, of the herd that we have of the station where I work, uh, they get past, there's not many get past 10 years of age. So that's, that's what we got here. Now, if... Have you got a problem with stability, or would you like to see more longevity in your herd, or do you feel good with what you got? Okay, so he saw that, and just like this gentleman talked about earlier, we could use a bull to improve that. You could use a bull to improve that if you feel like there's a problem. And it looks like you've got it across the board. It's not like you've got two here that are particularly low. Now, you do have one that's particularly high here, and with all your data that you've got, it'd be interesting to see if number 50, if her mother was better. Okay, so look at here. Look, at, give me a fist bump. That old, that one of the sixteen-year-old cow, her daughter scores the highest. So that's one time we can actually say this stuff actually makes sense and works. Is it always going to work like that? No. But Mr. McCants has proven this out that this sixteen-year-old cow has heifer number fifty, and she scores the best on stability. That just means how long they're going to be in the herd. And let's give you the the real definition here. Because this one is important. The chance a heifer will remain in the herd as a productive cow until at least six years of age or higher. That's important. they got to be in the herd six years to pay for themselves and actually make a year of money. So, Mr. McCants, number 50 heifer, I said you could let go of her. But looking at this right here, he may decide, I don't know. He may say, Jason, you're not right. I like this daddy right here. I think it's six and a half dozen other. You just got to pull, pull your heartstring and see which one goes your way, you know. I'm not necessarily going to keep her because she's going to live longer if she don't breed, if she doesn't keep her flesh, if she's going to cost me more money. Just because she lives longer isn't the end-all, be-all. They have to be good cattle, too. But part of being good cattle is, no doubt, longevity. Or the same thing here that they're calling it here is stability, some fancy term. How long are they going to stay in the herd? So here's the deal. Mr. McCants, he's got number 11. I think 11. I love that heifer, by the way. She's, she's, she's the cat's meow. 11 and... Um, the other heifer we just talked about, 50, those have the greatest longevity. Everything else is wonderful. Docility has got zero problems. Number 50, though, says she's not very good in docility. So you've got another strike there. She's not very good in docility, but she's not bad, right? You, you've got them tame as broke as they can possibly be. I mean, this is not a problem. But you can combine it with she's younger, she's born later in the calving season. All those things added together may not want to keep 50. Um, winning weight, there's no problems. All high scores. The higher number, the better, right? There's growth out the wazoo here at the McCants farm. I mean, there's no problems with growth, right? Average daily gain, same thing. He's been pushing for that. He's been selecting for it. It's not a surprise that they are off the charts. I mean, these are high. Uh, you, you would think you would see a three and a four and a five in here somewhere, but nope, not in these. Now, if we tested all his heifer progeny, the ones he didn't keep, he might have found a few. Uh, average daily gain, already done that one. Yearling weight, same thing. It all correlates, right? High, high, high. RFI. Here's an interesting tidbit. I said we wouldn't talk about this. 
I can't exactly explain this one very well in, in, in a hillbilly term that makes sense to me. So I'm just going to read it here. RFI, this is an indicator of feed efficiency. That's all we really need to know. It is the difference in animals' daily consumption of feed to achieve the same level of daily gain. Lower RFI indicates greater feed efficiency. So here's another thing that Mr. McCants can, if he so choose, to kind of focus on just a little bit, just a little bit. So these high-performing, high-growth genetics, which we talked about earlier, guess what they need? They need more feed. Any more. So do you want to go hammer down and go find the, the most efficient ones in the world? No, you don't want to do that either. You just maybe want to just tick it down when you can. It's just something to think about. I wouldn't worry about it a lot. But if you found a bull that met all your criteria and he was also good on, let's say, uh, the, the Angus EPDs for RADG and dry matter intake, you say, he's also good on efficiency. That may help you out. So when you're picking your AI bulls particularly, you can do that. You don't have to worry about going out and buy those bulls. You're not keeping those heifers. You're keeping your AI heifers. So um, you might just say, I'm going to look for a little, little bit more efficiency. But there's a balance because if you go the other extreme, they're super efficient, but they, they just get weird. That's just all I'll say. Your cattle are great cattle, so don't go changing the and reinventing the wheel. You know what I mean? But if you wanted to, to improve that, you could. Uh, yeah. So uh, scroll circumference. So scroll circumference is going to be a measure of, uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's going to be a measure of fertility of the daughters, right? Let's, a higher score equates to a higher score size. Well, it also equates to, uh, you know, puberty in your heifers, attaining puberty heifers quicker. And also, you're going to rebreed quicker after that first calf, generally speaking. All right. So you've got one heifer here, number 39. She's one that I liked visually okay, but I'm on luck here, and I'm like, eh. She's a three on milk. She's a two on stability. She's not puberty-wise. How did she score when uh, Dr. Jones did a pelvic exam on her? How did she do for a uh, yeah, reproductive tract score? One, two, three, four, or five. Okay. So she's puberty. She's fine. So she tested out in the real world, right? Okay. Um, and I go through the carcass stuff, and she's certainly fine there. So you know, from a data standpoint, 39 doesn't look that great, but Dr. Jones checked her out. She looks fine. I don't like the stability of milk on her necessarily. From a data standpoint, she's one that, I, that has three, three negatives. All right. And that's maybe the value of this. Do I want to keep 39 from a genetic standpoint? I like her visually, right? Look, look at the carcass, guys. I don't see a lot there. Marling is outstanding. He's got Angus cattle and has multiple years of uh, AI genetics. That's not a surprise. Ribeye area, there's nothing wrong there. They're not off the charts, but they're all mostly fives and above except for 63 which, I mean, cattle have mostly got plenty of ribeye most of the time, particularly these AI genetics that he's using. Fat, these cattle have a higher score for fat, all right? If he was feeding cattle out and getting really hardcore about it, he might decide to maybe lean that up just a nickel. However, cattle that fatten rebreed. So I'm not going, I'm probably not that worried about it. Now, if I had a whole bunch of tens there for some reason, I'm like, eh, they're a little too fat for their own good. Here's the story before we get to any further. You can get too smart on this stuff, all right? You can get too smart, too carried away, but we're learning, right? We're learning. This, the, when I see the fat and they're all, they're all a little bit high, above five, I'm thinking these cattle flesh easily and they rebreed. You could have tested these and they were two days old. In theory, we should have got the same deal, in theory. But good question. So tenderness, this is interesting. Just, do you sell some beef locally? Most of these are super good and high, except for uh, number 18 and number 34. All right. Now, number 34, she is the heifer, heifer that I didn't like, right? 34, though, she does really good all the way across here on a lot of data. Uh, except for tenderness is, is uh, poor, and uh, 18 and tenderness is poor. But they're Angus cattle with good marbling in modern day. I mean, when's the last time you guys bought a bad steak? It doesn't happen that much. It really doesn't, particularly with Angus influence. Through previous research and genetic testing and data turned in, they can tell the genetics, some genetics are going to be more tender based on what they call shear force data. So they take an in, a very expensive instrument and they take a cooked steak that has a little slice taken out of it and they take a, a knife and they go, mm, and it gets to the steak and it, it takes more pressure or less pressure. If it goes through really easy, I get a higher number here. If it takes more pressure, I get a lower number here on this deal. They developed these numbers based on all that previous testing, all that research and data that was submitted over the years. 
lots of it. Cooking a lot of steaks coming out of carcasses coming out of plants and they knew the sire and they can trace it back. And so this is this a big deal? No. It's not a big deal. But it's something to watch, maybe. Here's what he can do though. All these other ones, he can market all those other cattle, they should be pretty dog on tender, right? They, they compare to all the other ones being tested against. His progeny out of these females, if the sire chosen correctly, should make very tender, highly marbled, really good carcass uh, oriented type cattle. And the ribeye is perfect. Everything looks really good. We spent a lot of time talking about this. We could spend more time. Uh, I would say based on looking at the data, there's not one that just jumps out of me that I don't really care for except 39. And then 50, right? 50, we, uh, we saw that her docility was a little bit low. Um, and she's a little bit younger. That was based on that. Now let's roll this with Dr. Jones's data. Dr. Jones, did you see anything in your side of things uh, that was stuck out? They were peas in the pod, weren't they? Yeah. They look just like they 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 palpated just like they look. Super mm -hmm. consistent, uniform, no no problems, and that's why they look. That's why they look on paper. Mm -hmm. You can focus on stability if he wants to, or. Longevity in the herd, he could do that a couple of ways. He could bring in a semi-angus bull. Uh, he could look for somehow to find uh, longevity markers in the Angus breed or read up on that or something like that. Um, any other any things you could think of on improving longevity or how you might do that? Yeah, you yeah, could, could look at <clears throat> crossbreeding, design crossbreeding, looking at if they've got some you know, healthy bulls out there that, that you could crossbreed to, so crossbreed to. Um, for sure, semi. It really depends on on your goal. You could, you know, stability is going to be affected a lot by the heifers. You know, we talked a lot. There's a lot of places where you might do some selecting, and what we're what Jason and I are recommending here is not necessarily this is a hard and fast rule, but like. You know, you picked a heifer out of one of your oldest cows. I mean, that's that's obviously, see, that's farm proof. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've proved that on your farm, and then those cows do well under your management. So you can begin to identify those cows and say, you know, if they have a heifer at the beginning of calving season, I need to, I need to note that one because she might be one on my, you know, you start that list at birth, and... And if you've got cows that always have a calf at the very beginning of breeding season, that's a good trait, right? So you're starting to select cattle based on their performance within on your under your management in your farm. And then and then over time that list gets shorter, right? Because I start out, the list is pretty big, and then over time it shortens and I and I refine that. Ultimately, and Jason has said that too. We can say everything we want, but the bull's going to pick our best heifers because they're going to get pregnant first. You know, the heifers that get pregnant, and this data, I mean, that proof is, is 60 years old. The, the, the heifers that get bred early in the breeding season and calve first will stay in your herd longer. That, that is decades old. That's nothing exciting about that because it's just old, solid, reliable information. And, and um, you know, some people say, well, I'll breed my heifers and then do this. And keep, you know, because I know fertility is the most important thing in a cow-calf farm. Fertility is. All of these things are important. They might be important to me if I'm going to submit, if I'm going to feed my own cattle out and sell them, sell meat. Okay, you're going to want carcass traits, right? You're going to want feed conversion. You're going to want those growth traits. But for you, the very first thing that you're going to worry about is fertility. And 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 based on the heifers I just palpated, you're 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 you know you're going to I, I think you're going to do pretty good. Yeah. You've got the heifer pregnancy scores here. He's got Dr. Jones data. You put those things together, and you cannot find. Uh, 13 heifers were probably going to do as good as what we looked at today. In all sincerity, all those numbers that are above uh, seven are high percentage. I mean, that's you're the top end of all those that they're tested against. Um, 
A couple What's things, HCW? and I'll wrap up. What's that? What's HCW? Did you just hot, big hot, hot carcass weight is what that stands for. <clears throat> so they're going to be, you know, obviously plenty big. You know, that, that you get paid by the pound still, but they, they're going to have plenty of hot carcass weight to them. Yeah. Um, so a few take home messages from this. Let's say uh, Mr. McCants wanted to improve state ability in his herd. And that was a major thing to him. He could come in here and pull out four heifers really quick and say, I'm just done with it. He could make that. And if he kept doing that over two or three generations, well, he would improve his stay ability, right? That's what he could use this tool for. If he tested all, third, all 20 of his heifers, however many he had, he could have done that. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to go because this cattle are really good. I would have hate like the Dickens to, to get rid of some of these that score, you know, like that. But it, you see, the, you see the idea here. Let's say not all those cattle were as good as we saw today. They were, they were a little more up and down. Then I would maybe say, well, that number 10 heifer, she's a one-on stability, and she doesn't look as good. She's gone. Um, I might go down here to, let's say, uh, 68, and she's poor on milk. She's poor on stability. She doesn't look that good. And so we don't, we don't really have those issues here. But that's, that's the bulk of it, guys. If you got any questions, love to talk to you about it, but I won't take up any more of your time on it. One question. How much does it cost to get this data on each cow? Um, what, $30? $30, About $28, $29 okay. per cow. Yes. That's why you test your heifers only. That's the only way it can be really profitable because it's a selection tool to help you save some money. So if I, I see one on here that's got a big problem, I'm like, I ain't keeping that. You may have saved yourself uh, a development cost of five or six hundred bucks. Is how that might work. And one other one other thing I'd point out is that sometimes this this data can be different than the phenotypic data because of management. So if 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 I am putting just minimal management, then the heifers may so I can feed animals, which is going to mask some of these things because there's genetics and what's called epigenetics. So there's the genes that are there, and then there's everything else. And epigenetics is management, environment, nutrition, a lot of that. So sometimes I can um, take an animal that maybe, from a genetic standpoint, might not rank as high. And this is a ranking, I mean, uh, within these heifers of yours. But I, they may not rank as high, but they may perform just fine in my management system. <coughs> And so sometimes we can, sometimes we can, um, uh, either you can look at it two ways. You can either mask the genetics or you can make up for it with management. And, and that just, um, those heifers are in really good shape. So that's one of the reasons they look so good. The, the big ranchers do utilize this because they see some power in some numbers. However, I would caution anybody, you've got to look at them because the dairy industry has taking some of this genetic stuff too far. And I, you can tell you want more than I can, but they push one or two things. Well, there's problems that come with just looking at, just doing a single trait selection. You can come up with some problems. Let's say Mr. McCants that decides he wants to do um, all growth all the time, he could hurt his fertility. Right now his fertility is wonderful on the H HB R or HBG, um, and as he said. So he doesn't want to mess that up because that's the number one times four to eight, depending on who you talk to, is the number one trait in profitability is fertility. You can't get a bread that matter, right? I'm done, I'm gonna shut up. I really enjoy it. What's the better on the genetic test? At least, better depending on at least a month, depending on the time of year. So let's say you submit it in February after a bunch of fall calves or being tested or something like that, it might take you six weeks, or a month or six weeks. It's two mothers that pull out other calves <clears throat> sucking on her. Yeah. And you're pulling her body school. We're pulling her body and then her calf is not getting the nutrition. That's right. I've got a bull calf at home that I was hoping would turn into a herd bull, heifer bull, and his mama did the same thing. And so now the calves are running. Uh, that that kind of indiscriminate, I mean, no. How I don't do you prevent that. that from happening? Trailer. One way. One way. I think this is fantastic. Okay. I think it enlightens a lot of those people. What about the genetic field that you measure to make decisions back on the farm? In some cases, you have to spot what you need to take.
We may not have to, we may not be able to pay to get it done. We got to find that we committed. But we got to get data. We got to get patients so from scale, you know, record. We got to do something other than just looking at it to get some data to give us some idea of the team and what's going to be the best time in the future. And that's just what it does today. We would like to thank Southern SARE for their support through grant LS21358.